I have chosen for my theme in these next 60 minutes, Inerrancy, Evangelism, and Christ's Unbreakable Bible. If we are to share the gospel with confidence and preach with authority, then we must be sure that the message we are proclaiming and the book that we are expounding are true, all true. All we have to offer the world is truth and grace. You cannot have one without the other. If you think that you can magnify grace by shrinking truth, you will find that you make people blind to both. When you teach your children about the creation of the world and Noah and the flood and Moses and the Red Sea and Jesus walking on water and Jesus casting out demons and Jesus coming back to life, when you share your faith with your skeptical neighbor, when you open the Bible to teach your hungry small group, when you stand behind the pulpit to preach the Word of God verse by verse, year by year, decade by decade, there is one question that towers above all others. Are you telling the truth? When you get up on Sunday, are you telling the truth? As Al mentioned, we have, my wife and I have six kids, ages 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So we will see at T4G 2016 where we are at. <laughs> We're at that cutoff point. They don't make normal vehicles. The next step is like homeschool vehicles <laughs> for people. So we're, 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 we're right there. Our, our oldest two are boys, eight and ten. And they came in just a, a couple of weeks ago from the snow. We had snow. We, we still have piles of snow in our yard. Um, some of you, you minister in places like Florida and San Diego. And I can't help but think that there is some smaller portion of, of heaven for you. But <laughs> if Jonathan Edwards is right, it is ever increasing, but it starts smaller. <laughs> All of the brothers and sisters from Canada understand what I'm saying. I'm practically an honorary Canadian. A. We... So, so our two boys came in from the snow, and um, this has actually happened when I was at work, and I came home, and, and my wife said, you have to talk to the boys. I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just so frustrated. They came in, they're playing with all their friends, and they came in from the snow, and um, our eight-year-old, he, he's just got a, a face that's red and icy and bruised, and he's, he's crying because he said his older brother hit him with a snowball. I said, well, well what would you do when you talk to, talk to Ian, our older son? Well, he, he claims that he didn't do it. He said that, um, that, that, that Jacob just took some snow and started rubbing it in his face. Just, mm, and that's how he got the red spot. He said, oh, I'm so frustrated. I just won't tell the truth. And so I said, Ian, what, what happened? Well, he just took some snow and started rubbing in his face. I said, really? You're telling me you didn't throw any snowballs? Well, I mean, I, I threw one. I mean, maybe it hit a tree and then sort of bounced. Or I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> We're frustrated. So we, we, we had dinner and, and then we had our family devotions. I'm telling you, it doesn't usually go like this. But we, we had our family devotions. So, well, let's break off from what we normally do. And uh, let's just kind of get the law tonight. And... Uh, <laughs> And we did gospel too, but I said, I said, kids, we're going to read from 1 John chapter 1. If anyone claims to be without sin, they deceive themselves and the truth is not in them. But if they confess their sin, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us. So, we, so we, we talked about sin and we talked about the deception of sin and how we lie. We need to tell the truth. And, and the gospel is that if we confess that sin, then God will be faithful and just to forgive us. And so we went around the, the table and then I started and I confessed some of my sins. Then we went around to my daughter and she confessed. And then we got to my older son and I said, is there anything you'd like to say? Any sins? And he said, well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't respond in a good way when, when mom was upset with me. I said, okay, is there anything else? <laughs> anything at all? No. So we went over to my eight-year-old, and I said, and anything you would like to say? I took the snow and I rubbed it in my face. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and my wife and I did not know to laugh or cry. I just rushed around the table. I gave him a big hug. And just, he's just, I'm so sorry. What I did to my brother. I said, thank you for telling the truth. We don't have anything if we don't have the truth. If your people don't know that you are telling them the truth, we have nothing of eternal value to offer the world if we don't have the truth. And you may say, well, there you go again. You Christians think you have a monopoly on the truth. No, no. No monopoly. We have put all the truth on free parking for anyone who wants it. We're not claiming to have a monopoly on the truth. What do we have if we don't have the truth? And how do we have the truth if we cannot trust the Scriptures? You cannot trust politicians. Some of you would not trust a lawyer or a lobbyist. You may have a difficult time yourself proving to be trustworthy, but you can always trust this book, all of it, all the time, every verse, without fail, without exception, without end. Amen and amen. You can trust it. And my aim in this message is very simple. I want us to see what Jesus believed about the Scriptures so that we can know what we should believe about the Scriptures, and so we may know whether we can share this word and preach this word with merely a nice respect. This is an important book, and I honor it as an important record of people striving after God. Or can you preach it with something approximating divine authority? We're going to look at a few different passages in the Gospels. I invite you to first turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, looking in particular at verse 35, but let's start at verse 31 to understand the context. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So here is the context. They want to stone him because in verse 30 he has just pronounced that I and the Father are one. And they understand what some modern scholars refuse to understand, namely that Jesus believed himself to be divine. And so he quotes from their law. He actually quotes from the Psalms. Law can sometimes be an expansive term referring to anything in the Hebrew Scriptures. And he quotes from this obscure verse in an obscure Psalm. If you keep your finger in John, turn back to Psalm 82. It's not very long, and it's worth seeing what Jesus is doing here. Psalm 82, a Psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? 
Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And here's the verse. I said, you are God's son of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. This is strange psalm what Jesus is doing is quoting from that verse I said you are God's Elohim and it's used there it seems in reference to kings to judges to magistrates and actually to wicked kings and judge and magistrates now Jesus is not trying to prove his divinity from this one psalm rather he is trying to puncture their pretensions He's saying, look, you're hung up on the word God that I said I'm the son of God. You're, you're really hung up about that. You're agitated about that. Well, it says in the law that, in fact, these princes and these wicked rulers were called some sort of gods. What he's doing is demonstrating the highest view of the Old Testament scriptures. And we could ask all sorts of questions about what he's doing with the psalm itself and I think the point is simply to undermine their sort of pretensions about this word in particular but what we want to note is the comment he makes as almost an aside in verse 35 and the scripture cannot be broken what what's debated here is the deity of Christ and who he is and the title that he gives to himself what's not debated at all is whether the scripture can be broken he goes to the scripture because he understands that with his Jewish opponents he has a common ground here they all recognize scripture cannot be broken and so he has no hesitancy the divine son of God has no hesitancy in arguing his point from one word from an obscure psalm he's not making his point from one of the great passages in Exodus or one of the great servant songs in Isaiah he does not have to even prove that the psalm and the verse and the very word he is quoting is authoritative. Its authority is unquestioned because it is scripture. One commentator said, it was sufficient proof of the infallibility of any sentence or phrase or clause to show that it constituted a portion of what the Jews called the scripture. And so Jesus says scripture cannot be broken. The Greek word luo. And if you're taking Greek right now, that word is your great friend, luo. So wonderfully regular it is. Luo. It's the same word we'll see in a moment in Matthew 5.19. Whoever relaxes, whoever luo, whoever annuls, breaks, looses, nullifies, set aside... Jesus says the word scripture cannot be broken. It cannot be set aside, annulled, nullified, broken, loose. For Jesus, no word could be falsified. No promise or threat could fall short of fulfillment. No statement could be found guilty of error. The scriptures could not be broken because they were and are the word of God. And who would dare suggest that a word committed to writing by Almighty God could be an errant word or a wrong word or a broken word. Such a thing would not have been a sign of enlightenment to Jesus, but a sign of blasphemy. They all acknowledge the Scripture cannot be broken. How can it be broken? For it is God Himself speaking. And it's worth noting here, that Jesus believed this was an understandable word. Dozens of times, we all know this, but we, we don't think of the implications of it. Dozens of times, Jesus appeals to a text from the Old Testament thinking that such an appeal settles the dispute, or at least it ought to if they had ears to hear. And this implies not only that Jesus believed the Old Testament was authoritative, but also he believed that it had a shared, discernible meaning. Jesus, in often referencing the Scriptures as evidence for His teaching, other times He chides 
the Jews for not conforming to the word of God. Six times Jesus says, have you not read? Suggesting that if they knew the scriptures, they would not be making the mistake they were making. And the apostles did the same thing, quoting from the scriptures, reasoning from the scriptures, alluding to them, finding in them fulfillment, all with the assumption that these texts only said what was true and the truth that they communicated could be understood. This sort of reader response theory would have been very strange to Jesus. He understood that this word, though at times it takes illumination by the Spirit to really appropriate what it says, could nevertheless be understood even by his opponents, for why else would he reference it? Because it was God's Word. Sometimes people, you know, you've heard this, this poem about the, the six blind men and the elephant. And you have six blind men and they're all groping about and then one of them touches the elephant's side and says it's a wall. And one of them pulls on his trunk and says it's a, a rope. And one of them pulls on his ear and says it's a fan. And, and as this little doggerel goes, the poem, the point is, this is what we're all like in religion. This is what we're all like with God. We're just blind men and we're just sort of groping about and we all feel a part of the elephant and we think we know what we're talking about but we're just seeing a part of it and that's what religion is like and we all have our interpretations and we're all just sort of getting a little bit of the elephant and we don't know really what it is. Well, I hope you can see two colossal problems with that analogy. One, the analogy is told from the position of omnif omniscience that the person who's telling this, he in fact knows that it is an elephant. But even more importantly, the whole analogy breaks down if the elephant speaks. <laughs> if the elephant says, I'm an elephant, hmm, hmm. I think this is a mystery. No, I'm an elephant. Mm. Guys, what do you think? Should we have a conference about this? There's like a paradox here going on. I'm just in this great cloud of unknown. I'm an elephant. At that point, is your chastened epistemology a sign of your humility or that you are hard of hearing? The elephant speaks. And, and I hope, brothers and sisters, you can see what a dead end it is when some voices would say, look, look, we, we should not talk about homosexuality. We should not talk about these controversial things because there is no consensus in the church. There is no consensus. We, we, we want to wait. We want to have a moratorium until finally, because there's just good people and there's smart people on both sides who think this, they're that. Look, I have been a part of a mainline denomination all my life. And we have been in dialogue about homosexuality for 40 years. It is death by dialogue because the conversation only continues until unorthodoxy has its sway and then the conversation is over. And if voices were to say, well, let us wait until there is a consensus in the church, I say, sure, by all means, let us, let us work with the consensus of the church, but let us not take the, consensus, this, the, the, the skewed waiting for consensus of the liberal wing of the academia of the Western church. Let us take the global church and let us take the church over 2,000 years and you will find quite a remarkable consensus on this point. To, to, to let the small minority in the West of the main line of evangelicals hanging on to the last ladder of their faith to prohibit us from speaking what God has said with tears and with courage is utter folly. We are just a, a speck in this span of the history of the church. The one democracy that is never consulted is the democracy of the dead. What have those saints who have gone before us? We are here in the West with our enlightenment sort of liberal Christianity. We are but a pimple on the face of Christ. And hardly that. Second, let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, Scripture cannot be broken in John 10. And he says, much the same in Matthew chapter 5, these famous verses in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 17, 18, and 19. Matthew 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus brings together the law and the prophets. He says you cannot separate the two. And what you notice here, Jesus has in mind not just the charismatic event, the, the Word of God coming alive to us by the Spirit in preaching, as neo-Orthodoxy might teach. But He has in mind the, the written Word. We know this because He references the Yoda. Not that Yoda. But the other Yoda. <laughs> little one. And a dot, the smallest little diacritical marks in the text, he says, down to those smallest letters, down to those little markings, Jesus refused to abolish or loose or relax or set aside or break or deny or question or reject the smallest speck of Scripture. Not at all. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, especially in chapter 5, Jesus is pressing home the full extent of Scripture. Now, yes, he will gladly undermine the false traditions of the scribes and Pharisees. He will even correct their false interpretations of Scripture, thinking, for example, that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was some kind of uh, legal prescription for personal vengeance. But what he shows over and over is that the Word of God must not be circumvented by traditions and evasive reasoning. Instead, every speck must be applied to our lives. Donald McLeod says, For Jesus, jot and tittle loyalty to Scripture is neither legalistic nor evasive. Jot and tittle fulfillment of the law means avoiding anger as well as homicide, lust as well as fornication, swearing as well as perjury. It means turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, blowing no trumpets when we make donations for charity. You remember what Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23? He's, he's pronouncing his woes upon the scribes and Pharisees. He says, oh, woe to you. You tithe your mint and your dill and your, your cumin. I mean, know what that is, but it uh, sounds a little too healthy. You tithe your mint and your dill and your cumin, and you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And then Jesus said, as long as you get justice, mercy, and faithfulness, forget about it. Who cares about the rest? Don't be a legalist. Is that what he said? He said, those you should have done without neglecting the others. Well, Jesus, I'm being real uptight here. Those are illegalists. Like, isn't this just the big picture? You know, like, I got justice in my heart, and I love people, and I'm kind to people, and you, you, you want me at that point in redemptive history, at least, to, to, to tithe out my, my little mint? Jesus says, well, that you should have done without neglecting the other." Jesus commends to us by his example and by his teaching the careful study of Scripture. He expected obedience to the spirit of the law and to the letter. Of course, there are redemptive historical things going on where elements of the Mosaic dispensation or covenant are finding fulfillment in Christ. But it is never that he would set aside something from the Word of God. It may be fulfilled and, and, and the, the shadow may pass away for greater substance, but never annulled, never loose, never broken. He criticizes his opponents for not knowing their Bibles. He says, have you not read? He says, you are in error because you do not know the Scriptures. Jesus shows familiarity with every kind of Scripture and references it all as equally true and authoritative, never to be broken. Turn over a few more chapters to Matthew chapter 12. Verses 38 through 42. This is our third of four passages I want us to look at. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus consistently treats biblical history as the narrative of facts. He makes references to Abel, Noah, Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah, Isaac and Jacob, manna in the wilderness, the serpent in the wilderness, Moses, David, Solomon, the queen of Sheba, Elijah, Elisha, the widow of Zarephath, Naaman, Jonah, Zechariah, and he never questions a single story, a single miracle, or a single historical claim. Now this is the one that, that if you're going to wiggle on, it would be this, and people will say, well... How do we know that Jonah really happened? I mean, that he really was in the belly of a fish. and that, that could have been just a story. Every culture has stories. Jesus could be referencing the story. Could be saying just as Aslan broke the stone table. He could be saying just as the, the, the men of the West defended Gondor. And he could just be talking about some, some great story. Well, that will not work. Because look at who else he mentions. He mentions the Queen of Sheba. Demonstrably a historical person. The Queen of Sheba will rise up. And then he says the men of Nineveh will rise up at judgment. The men of Nineveh will rise up up at these cities to say they repented at a a lesser, at a, a lesser clarity of the gospel and you are not repenting when the Son of Man is in your midst. They will rise up. Now are we to think that he means something other than real people from Nineveh. If I were to say to you, with dire warning, you ought to repent, or the men of Gondor will rise up against you. (laughs) Say, all right, man, you're getting your nerd on. I get it, I get it. (laughs) One commentator says, are we to suppose Jesus to say that imaginary persons who at the imaginary preaching of an imaginary prophet repented in imagination shall rise up in that day and condemn the actual impenitence of those his actual hearers? That's a good question. If Jesus is right in his acceptance, straightforward acceptance of Old Testament history, then boatloads, titanic loads of modern biblical criticism must be wrong. For the past 150 to 200 years, many modern scholars have argued that the Old Testament is far different from what it seems. The first five books were not written by Moses, uh, but they were the product of an elaborate combination of different sources, some of which are a thousand years later than Moses. Isaiah was not written by Isaiah, but by two Isaiahs. Wait, 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 not two, three Isaiahs, whose predictions actually were not predictions, but were after the fact pronouncements. If liberal scholars are right, the church misread Israel's history for almost two millennia. Israel's story then was not about centuries of struggle to be faithful to the one true God and obey his law. What took place instead, they say, is a kind of evolutionary development. Israel moved from animism to polytheism to henotheism. What they mean is you worship one God among many gods existent. And then from henotheism to monotheism, and finally to the triumph of priestly legalism. And books that claim to be from the Exodus are later than Ezekiel. And 1 Samuel, which was thought to be written after the giving of the law, actually describes Israel before the law. And the Pentateuch, instead of being the foundation for Israel's life, actually came after the glory days were far behind her. This is part and parcel of what seems plain to so much modern scholarship and is not remotely connected to anything we see from Jesus in how he handles the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus believed Israel was, during its long history, under tutelage of Yahweh. He believed that Moses gave a national covenant to live by, that the Pentateuch came at the beginning of their history, that the prophets rebuked and refined Israel for their failures. If the revisionist history is correct, Jesus was monumentally wrong in believing all this. 
So people say, well, you're just, if you want to cling to your 19th century old Princeton doctrine of inerrancy and believe these things, and so be it. No, no, no. That's not what you lose. You don't just lose Hodge or Warfield. You're going to lose Jesus on this one. For he did not realize that Leviticus was a betrayal of ethical monotheism. As one author says, he was totally unaware of the contradictions that demonstrate Moses did not write Deuteronomy. He was taken in by a national myth no more plausible than that of Romulus and Remus. Is it not plausible to think that Jesus perhaps knew Jewish history better than 19th century Germans? (laughs) Isn't it safer to side with Jesus and his supremely high view of inspiration and his straightforward understanding of history and chronology. Jesus not only believed the scriptures could not be broken and that every jot and tittle were from God himself, but he approached the scriptures believing the chronology was chronological, the history was historical, and the authors of the biblical books were who the Jews thought them to be. I remember when I first came to my church 10 years ago and I still had some of my seminary debates fresh in the rearview mirror and I started a series on Ephesians and I thought I know these debates are out there and I need to you know we have a pretty intelligent congregation I said as I start this series I should really do maybe 15 minutes on the Pauline authorship of Ephesians just kind of bolster this and people in my congregation were were looking at their Bibles Paul (laughs) to the to the church in in Ephesus all right I'm tracking with you I'm I I believe it. This could have been 15 minutes shorter. The, the, The Greeks and Romans had lots of myths, and they didn't particularly care whether Hercules actually was the illegitimate son of Zeus. It was a fable, a tall tale. It was meant to explain the world. This is entirely different from Christianity and from the Jewish faith from which it sprang where history has always mattered. Several years ago, around Christmas time, I wrote a blog about the importance of the the virgin birth. And another minister, one from my denomination, was going back and forth and writing about, kind of, well, he he wasn't sure, and and maybe um, Isaiah just meant a a young woman, and maybe Matthew meant that. And, And he finally, as we went back and forth, this is what he said. Do I think the virgin birth is essential to our creed as Christians? That's not really mine to say, is it? As you say, it has been confessed for centuries, and thus I need to take it seriously and to wrestle with how I understand it. For my part, I take the statement to Mary, all things are possible with God, as more valuable to my faith than the statement, how can this be since I am still a virgin? I don't claim that you need to accept my understanding, nor would I imagine that you would claim that I must necessarily accept your understanding. To which I replied, I do in fact think you need to accept my understanding because it is not my understanding, but it is the record of the Holy Gospel writers inspired by the Holy Spirit and it has been the record of the church universal throughout the centuries. If you are a 15 year old or you are a first year seminary student and you are wrestling with these things, then by all means, let us have remarkable patience. But if you are a preacher of God's word, and James 3, 1 says, not many of you should be teachers, for you will be judged more strictly. And all you can do with the virgin birth is take it seriously and wrestle with it. And you're not a position to be preaching from God's word. You're not. This cannot be stated too strongly. Christianity, from the very beginning, tied itself to history. The most important claims of Christianity are historical claims. And on this history, Christianity must rise or fall. If Jesus has not risen from the dead, it's not a great symbol. It's a great hoax. And you are, of all people, most to be pitied. Pack it in. Sleep in. Enjoy football. Do something else if this is in history. Because the New Testament tells us there was a man 
A baby born of a woman in Bethlehem, and thousands of people saw him and knew him. And he did miracles witnessed by multitudes, and he died and rose and appeared to more than 5,000 witnesses at one time. And everyone knew the location of his tomb, and it was empty and open to examination. And three disciples were eyewitnesses of his majesty on the mountain, and they saw the event. And the Spirit inspired them to record it. We do not follow myths. We are not interested in stories with a nice moral to them. We are not helped by hoping in spiritual possibilities. Why should it matter anything to your faith that nothing is impossible with God if He cannot have a virgin give birth? These things in the gospel happened. God predicted them. He fulfilled them. He inspired the written record of them. To discount history is to live in a different world than the ones that the biblical authors inhabited. And one final passage. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 verse 3. And Pharisees came up to him, to Jesus, and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now keep your finger there, and you know where this comes from. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2. And you see what Jesus is quoting. I want you to notice this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, now who's, who's saying that? Adam didn't say that. Eve didn't say that. An angel didn't say that. This is narration. This is simply a verse in Scripture. There, there, there's, there's no unique voice attributed to it in Genesis chapter 2. Now you go back to Matthew 19, and did you notice what Jesus said? Have you not read that He who created them, the Creator, from the beginning made them male and female, and said, who said? Oh, same subject. He who created them from the beginning said, the Creator said this, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. How could Jesus say that? Except that he understood, as the Jews would have, that to quote from a verse in their scripture was to quote from the Creator himself. God Himself said this. The Creator who made them was the Creator who spoke this. Though there is no record of, of divine voice in Genesis 2, yet because it was written in Scripture, Jesus understands that's what God said. Jesus can reference human authors, Moses, Isaiah, David, Daniel. But they stand in the background. They are the sub-authors standing under the principal author of Scripture, God Himself. So Mark 12, 36, he says, David himself in the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 3, the Holy Spirit says. Romans 9, 17, the Scripture says to Pharaoh. Galatians 3, 8, the Scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Jesus and the apostles can use God and Scripture interchangeably. Their authority is the same because God is the author of Scripture and Scripture is the Word of God. Before we would think it is a mark of our sophistication to minimize or somehow weaken the authority of Scripture, we should remember that our Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of Man and Son of God, when He was tempted by the devil, did not draw down on superpowers or lightning bolts from His eyes, but He said three times, It is written. And if quoting Deuteronomy to the devil was enough for Jesus, it should be enough for us. It is written. For Jesus, Scripture is powerful, decisive, and authoritative because it is the voice of God. It is as true as God is true. 
And people say, whoa, 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 whoa. We got, but but you, you evangelicals, you conservatives here, you're all about the Word and scripturated. We're about the Word made flesh. To quote D.A. Carson, damn all false dichotomies to hell. These two modes of revelation reveal to us one God, one truth, one way, one coherent set of promises, threats, and commands. Of course, we do not identify the, the actual artifact of, of ink and pages as somehow being divine. But we must not seek to know the Word who is divine apart from the divine words of the Bible. And we ought not to read the words of the Bible without an eye to the Word incarnate. When it comes to seeing God and His truth in Christ and in the Holy Scripture, one is not more reliable or more trustworthy or more relevant than the other. Scripture, because it is the breathed out Word of God, possesses the same authority as the God-man Jesus Christ. Sub submission to the Scriptures is submission to God. Rebellion against the Scriptures is rebellion against God. The Bible, the Bible can no more fall or fail or falter than God Himself can fall or fail or falter. Scripture must be inerrant because Scripture is the Word of God and God is inerrant. Inerrancy means that the Word of God always stands over us and we never stand over the Word of God. If you reject inerrancy, no matter how sort of caveats, qualifications you put on it, I'm just talking about a few historical things, I'm just talking about a few um, just little facts that don't really pertain to the main gospel storyline of Scripture, however you parse it. There's no avoiding the fact that if we reject inerrancy, we must put ourselves in judgment over God's Word. That we have claimed the right to determine which parts of God's revelation can be trusted and which cannot. When we deny the complete trustworthiness of Scripture, its genuine claims with regard to history, its teachings on the material world, its miracles, its tiniest jots and tittles of all that it affirms, if we reject that, we are forced to affirm one of two conclusions. Either the Scripture is not all from God, or God is not always reliable. And both of those assertions are sub-Christian. They do not express a proper submission to the Father, and they do not work for our joy in Christ, and they do not bring honor to the Holy Spirit who carried men along that they might speak the Word of God. It will not do to find some kind of halfway house where most everything really important in the Bible is true, but then there's a, fun, a few things that we you know, aren't, can't really trust. This kind of compromised Christianity will not satisfy the soul, and it will not animate you for evangelism. How are we to believe in a God who can do the unimaginable and forgive our trespasses and conquer our sins and give us hope in a dark world if we cannot believe that this God could create the world out of nothing and give the virgin a child and raise his son on the third day? Listen, we are sometimes told, and this really throws us for a loop sometimes, we're sometimes told, look, the final authority for us as Christians um, should be Christ not the Scriptures. Right, we, don't, we don't worship the Scriptures. The Bible didn't die for our sins. It's Christ. And you'll hear that and you think, well, yeah, I don't, what do I do? I don't want to do anything to undermine Christ. And it's suggested, therefore, that Christ perhaps would have us accept only portions of Scripture or maybe the things that, that coincide with His life and teaching. Or, but, but certain aspects of biblical history and chronology and cosmology need not bother us because Christ would not have been bothered by them. Look, what's really important is Christ. And the idea put forward by many liberal Christians and not a few self-proclaimed evangelicals if, is that if we are to worship Christ and not the Scriptures, we must let Christ stand apart from Scripture and stand above Scripture. But, J.I. Packer asks, who is this Christ, the judge of Scripture? Not the Christ of the New Testament. That Christ does not judge Scripture. He obeys it and fulfills it. By word and deed, He endorses the authority of the whole of it. Those with a high view of Scripture may be charged with idolatry, bibliolatry, 
But listen, that accusation is laid at the wrong feet. Again, J.I. Packer, a Christ who permits his followers to set him up as the judge of Scripture, one by whom its authority must be confirmed before it becomes binding, and by whose adverse sentence it is in places annulled, is a Christ of human imagination. One whose attitude to Scripture is the opposite of that of the Christ of history. If the construction of such a Christ is not a breach of the second commandment, it is hard to see what is. Do you see what Packer is arguing? The only Jesus who stands in judgment over Scripture is the Jesus of our own invention. And that is a violation of the second commandment. Here's where it gets most practical for us in ministry and preachers, as you stand behind the pulpit to preach, verse by verse, year after year, decade after decade, what will your people sense is the final word? You or the Bible, their experience or the Bible, peer-reviewed journals or the Bible, their sense of God's own inner workings in their soul or the Bible. Biology or the Bible? Cultural acceptance or the Bible? That means you must take great pains not only to be speaking what is true, but to show it manifestly from the text so that you're not creating uh, a whole class of people in your church who trust you because you seem so wicked smart. And trust you because you can say, well, it says in the Greek, I know you got this Bible and like 30 people smarter than me translate, but it says in the Greek... And you just use Hebrew, Greek, and the context. If you're going to use the context, you need to show them that that is, in fact, the context. You do not want to create people in your church who just say, oh, I just trust my pastor. Well, it's good to trust you, but you'll be wrong. This is the only word that will never be wrong. What will you and your people trust completely and unreservedly. I've said this often to my congregation recently, especially as these issues of sexuality so rampant in our culture, and we talk about them in our church, especially if those have come up. I, I've said something like this often. I said, look, you need to resolve in your own mind and heart right now, on this morning, in the relative safety of this place, surrounded by people you know and like, worshiping God together. You need to decide now whether you will stand on this word or some other word. And you decide it now. Do you believe this? So many churches falter and stumble because they have ministers who have slipped in their actual trust and confidence in the word of God. I've preaching, been preaching through Acts for two years. And it came to Acts 24 a couple of weeks ago. And you know there's Paul and he's before Felix and Drusilla. And if you read the context, you read Josephus, you understand something about Felix and Drusilla. Uh, Felix was on his third wife, and Drusilla, this was her second husband, and Felix had lured her away from her other husband who had been circumcised to marry her, and now he married this uncircumcised, she married this uncircumcised Gentile, and they're in this uh, relationship that should have never been. And so when, when Paul has an audience to speak to these sorts of people, what does he preach? He might, we, we might be thinking, okay, what well, can I say? That's, that's true, but maybe this would be a time to sort of Jesus fills the God-sized hole in your heart kind of message. Um, maybe this would be sort of Felix, um, you, you killed Jonathan the high priest, but let's not talk about that. Let's just talk, you know, if you follow Jesus, if, if, you, if you follow the way of the kingdom, you can really be a, you know, a, a great procurator. It says instead that Felix reasoned to them likely from the scriptures, about three things. Righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. Is that what you would have picked? Those th I have three points, Felix, three-point sermon. First, self-control. You don't have it. Righteousness, you need it. Coming judgment, it's coming. And it says that Felix was alarmed. Does your gospel alarm anyone? It should. Do you believe there is a coming judgment? 
You know, C.S. Lewis once said, everyone, all you Christians, is all pie in the sky. And Lewis said, well, at some point we have to ask ourselves, is there pie in the sky or not? Because if there is, if there is a coming judgment, how can we not speak of it? You men charged with the task of preaching are, as Ezekiel said, the watchmen on the walls. If you do not blow the trumpet when the judgment is coming, you will have blood on your hands. And I don't want anyone in my church to be able to stand before God on that day and say, I never knew from my preacher that I needed a Savior. I never knew I needed to repent. I never knew there was a hell. David Hansen, his book on pastoring, says, there is an important place in the ministry for honest questioning over doctrinal issues, but... I'm not proud of my tossing and turning over hell. Some pastors wear their agnosticism about hell as a badge of honor. I've tried it. I've acted as if struggling to believe our Lord's words were a virtue, but I've always found that when I became proud of my doubts, they became the sin of unbelief. For me, finally, waffling over hell became the sin of unbelief. Is everything in this book taken in context, interpreted correctly, is it all the truth? If not, then you will need to correct, qualify, and come to the task of evangelism somewhat cowardly. But if it is all true, you can come with confidence. You can have boldness, which is not a personality, it's not an arrogance, it's not a bravado. To be bold is to be clear in the face of fear. Like I don't want to say what I'm going to say. and Nobody wants to hear what I'm going to say, but I will say it. They marveled at Jesus. Why? The crowds marveled. He was not like the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. They marveled because why? He was so clever. He was really, really hilarious. They marveled at him because the guy just had degrees. Just all, I mean, he was just, he read a lot of books. They marveled because he spoke as one who had authority. Hughes Oliphant Old, his magisterial volumes on the reading and preaching of scriptures and the worship of the Christian church, has a fascinating section on John MacArthur. I told him I was going to mention this. Old says, he, you can tell he's sort of wrestling, doesn't know what to do with, with John MacArthur. He says, MacArthur never has the least shadow of doubt but that these miracles took place exactly as they are recorded. He simply assumes it is all quite reliable. And after listening to a series of sermons, Old starts to wrestle with his own doubts. He says, the place where I have always had the greatest trouble is the whole matter of exorcism. I really do not believe in Satan, demonic spirits and demon possession. Maybe I ought to, but I don't. I'm willing to agree that I may have been too strongly influenced by the intellectual world in which I was brought up to fully grasp the teaching of Scripture, but that's the way it is. What is more than clear to me after listening to these sermons is that those who can take the text the way it seems, well, it makes a lot more sense than those who are trying to second guess it. And then he says this about John MacArthur's preaching. And we would all do well to have such a paragraph written about us someday. Why do so many people listen to MacArthur? This product of all the wrong schools? How can he pack out a church on Sunday morning in an age in which church attendance has seriously lagged? Here is a preacher who has nothing in the way of a winning personality. I, I told him I was it. Good looks or charm. Here is a preacher who offers us nothing in the way of sophisticated homiletical packaging. No one would suggest he is a master of the art of oratory. What he seems to have is a witness to true authority. He recognizes in Scripture the Word of God, and when he preaches, it is Scripture that one hears. It is not the words of John MacArthur that are so interesting as it is that the Word of God is of surpassing interest. That is why one listens.
Pastors, do you believe, do you really believe that the Word of God is sufficient to do the work of God? Do you really believe that? Or if you don't, you will have gimmicks and gadgets and you will try to be clever and find tricks. Do you really know that you have nothing in your arsenal except for the Word of God and prayer? And if you know how to grow your church apart from the Word of God and prayer, then don't bother growing it because it may not be a church. We have nothing but the Word of God and prayer. And it's enough. You get up into the pulpit, and I know this, I get done almost every Sunday, and I feel like, what a colossal waste of time. I do. Maybe it's my pride, maybe it's the devil, maybe it's reality. I think, what was that? <laughs> and we have a second service. <laughs> this is why Mark Dever only has one service. <laughs> I I'm helped to think of Lloyd-Jones who said he could only ever remember truly preaching twice in his life and both times he woke up. And you can stand there and you know your people's problems and you know the culture and you know your own weakness and it feels like God has given you just a little teeny, a little pea shooter and just a little, a little spit wad and you're just... And people are there in their bunkers, six feet of concrete and just... Turn in your Bibles. Brothers, He has given you hand grenades. And this Sunday you go lob a few for Jesus. And you pull the pin. And just with a smile, you just, <laughs> you just wait when the Holy Spirit's going to blow that thing. Do you really believe this word of God is sufficient to do the work of God? Do you believe it? I love that, that illustration. You may have heard that story about Benjamin Franklin, who was no kind of evangelical Christian, and he kept going to hear George Whitfield preach, and someone said, Franklin, why do you keep hearing Whitfield preach? You don't believe a word he says. To which Franklin replied, I know, but he does. And he wanted to hear him. Do you have that passion? You can have almost any kind of worship style. You can have any manner of preaching, homiletical approaches and styles, but are you giving people your best stuff from the text with authority? You believe it. There's a passion there. Lloyd-Jones once said to a young man considering ministry, I don't want to know if you can set the world on fire. I want to know that if I pick you up by the scruff of your neck and drop you into the Thames, that it would sizzle. The Thames is a river in, in London. It looks like the Thames, just there. Would you sizzle? The world dislikes so much of what we have to say and it positively hates that you would be sure about saying it. You can say almost anything you want if it doesn't seem like you mean it. You can give almost any message. If you preface every sermon with, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. You know, because that's really how Stephen preached and Paul and Peter before the Sanhedrin when it says he looked at them intently in the eyes. He just did a lot of kind of caveats and a lot of qualifications and I don't really know and I'm not quite sure and just inviting you to discover with me. <laughs> you can say the hardest things if everyone senses that you're hardly sure about what you're saying. The challenge of evangelism and the challenge of preaching in our day is twofold. Whether we dare to say what God's Word says and whether we dare to speak as if God Himself has said it. The work of evangelism must be grounded in the doctrine of inerrancy which must be rooted in Christ's own commitment to Scripture. Jesus held Scripture in the highest esteem. He knew His Bible intimately and loved it deeply. He often spoke with the language of Scripture. He easily alluded to Scripture. And in His moments of greatest trial and weakness, like being tempted by the devil or being crucified on a cross, he quoted Scripture. 
His mission was to fulfill Scripture. His teaching always upheld Scripture. He never disrespected, never disregarded, never disagreed with a single text of Scripture. He affirmed every bit of law, prophecy, narrative, and poetry. He never for a moment accepted the legitimacy of anyone, anywhere, violating, ignoring, refining, or rejecting Scripture. He would not have retweeted them. He would have not have applauded them for being authentic, nor published their books, nor invited them to speak in an effort to further the conversation. He believed in the inspiration of Scripture, all of it. He accepted the chronology, the miracles, the authorial ascriptions. He believed in keeping the spirit of the law without ever minimizing the letter of the law. He affirmed the human authorship of Scripture while at the same time bearing witness to the divine authorship of Scripture. He treated the Bible as a necessary word, a sufficient word, a clear word, and the final word. It was never acceptable in the mind of our Savior to contradict Scripture or stand above Scripture. He believed it was all true, all edifying, all important, and all about him. He believed absolutely that the Bible was from God and absolutely free from error. What scripture says, God says, and what God said has been recorded infallibly in scripture. Well, are we then just guilty of bibliolatry? Nonsense. It is impossible to revere the scriptures more deeply or affirm them more completely than Jesus did. Jesus submitted his will to the scriptures. He committed his brain to studying the scriptures. He humbled his heart to obey the scriptures. The Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, believed the Bible was the Word of God down to the sentences, to the phrases, to the words, to the smallest letter, to the tiniest speck, and that nothing in all those specks and in all those books, in all of His Holy Bible, could ever be broken. And thus He spoke. And so should we. With truth, with grace, and with utter confidence and joyful hope. Let us pray. You have given us, Lord, such a privilege that we should be servants of your word. We are not worthy of it. You have given us ears to hear, though we do not deserve these ears or these eyes to see. Give the brothers here confidence, joy, discipline, hard work, and to proclaim as a herald that we have a word from our King. And it may be a hard word, but it is always a good word. And it is unbreakable. We thank you. In Jesus, amen.